Uh, it is good to see you all. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Paul. Paul, if you'd bring up a few of the CDs, a wee selection, I'll just mention them. Uh, while he's doing that, again, we give you all a, a warm welcome. The meetings uh, obviously commence tonight. They'll continue each uh, Friday night at 8 o'clock. And afterwards, there's a cup of tea for everyone. If you want to just stay for a little while, you can get a cup of tea and uh, a few biscuits or just whatever it is. So you're all, you're all welcome to that. So here's a good man. Thank you very much. Great job. Thank you. Uh, there's some of the CDs, just to, just to make you aware of them, uh, Paul has CDs at the back and DVDs, so if you'd like to take a look at those after the meeting, you're welcome. I'm going to run through a few of them. One of them is the Menace of Freemasonry. Uh, many people are not familiar with the dangers uh, and the problems that come with Freemasonry. Now, from what I hear, there's been a, a, a somewhat, a, a, kind of a, a little bit of a revival of Freemasonry, and uh, the organisation had been going down but uh, from what I hear, there's a kind of a recruitment to try and get a lot of young men into it. Uh, now, people that join Freemasons generally, in fact, I would say 100%, have no idea of the spiritual dangers behind it. They have no idea. It's only those that travel up the ranks of Freemasonry when they get up into the latter stages of 32nd degree or prior to that. But when you get up, then you begin to really recognize what it's about. And so if you want to know more about it, you can listen to that. That was made by a pastor, uh, uh, Pastor Walker Gorman. Uh, then there's one, uh, Christianity versus homosexuality, a subject that's a, a real uh, issue, a, a real burning issue today in the country. During the week, I was listening to a CD uh, of a family, and it was really sad because the young man who uh, had said he, he had become a Christian um, and I don't doubt that he had actually sought the Lord, but he couldn't get free of, of the, the temptation and the light. He just couldn't, couldn't break it. And so his mom and dad were, were Christians. And uh, eventually, because he just couldn't find a way out, he came to the conclusion and stated that this is the way God had made him. Now, that's a very common view. And his parents said that was okay. And so they were all, they were all Christians really sad. And you'll see the reason for that when we look at the message later on. And one of the reasons why that's happening in the Christian church today is because Christians haven't an answer as to what is this problem? What is the origins of it? Uh, and it's, it's, it's deeper than what people realize. So if you want to know a little bit about those questions and some of the answers, you should find it on that uh, CD. And then there's one on uh, curses and cause and cure. Again, that's all interlinked with Freemasonry, but it's just two CDs on the subject of curses, cause and cure. And uh, Paul is those. They're all four or five pounds. They don't really cost that much. And then here's one on signs and signals of Jezebel spirit. A person can be under the influence, even as a Christian, under the influence of things that are not healthy or good. And uh, the Jezebel spirit is mentioned numerously in the uh, Old and New Testament. So if you want to know a little bit more about that and how it affects persons who are under its influence, you can get that. So there's a number of others. So I'm, I, I normally don't go through it that much because uh, a lot of people that come, come regular, but some of you are new. So please uh, take a little look at those and hopefully you'll maybe get something that'll help you put it in the car and listen to it whenever you're traveling. Bibles to the book of Galatians. We're going to turn to the book of Galatians and chapter 6. So we're going to look at uh, some verses in this book or this chapter. And if you want to leave your Bible open, we will be looking at a few other verses during our time. But let's, let's turn. It's the last chapter of the book of Galatians, which Paul the Apostle wrote. It was actually one of the first books that he wrote. Although it's in after the book of Romans, it was actually written before the book of Romans. I'm sure most of you are aware that the Bible is not chronological. It's not in an order. Uh, you can apparently buy a Bible that is in chron chronological order. I wouldn't say that it would be necessarily a wise thing to do, but nevertheless you can. So let's turn together to Galatians chapter 6, and we're going to commence at verse 1. 
Brethren, if a man be overtaken with a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. If a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of his flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith, in other words, believers. Ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. By the way, Paul uh, is saying this. Most commentators agree that Paul had an eye condition, and as a result, his sight was greatly impaired. And so this is the reason he's writing this, because he said, I have written it myself uh, just to make you aware of how concerned I am that I'm not letting someone else write it. Verse 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Amen. And we know God will bless the reading of his word. Now let's unite in prayer. <coughs> our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to meet together around the word of God. We thank you for the uniqueness of the people of God coming together. We thank you, Lord, there is no other gathering on earth that is like it. And so we bless you, Lord, that you have promised where two or three are gathered and drawn together by the Holy Spirit. There I will be in the midst. We ask, Lord, for the outpouring of your Spirit. We ask that you will send the blessed third person of the Trinity to make Jesus real. I take authority in Jesus' name over every spirit that is in opposition or in any way would interfere or prevent the word of God having influence in the lives of your people. And I pray for the anointing now of the spirit. Pour out thy spirit, Lord, upon us. We really need you. And so we bow in your presence, acknowledge our need, and we pray, Lord, that you will put a a wall and a hedge around us and grant us an awareness that Jesus is here. For we ask it for his name's sake. Amen and amen. I have entitled this uh, message, Defense of the Cross. The culmination of the entire book is found in the verse 14, which we have looked at before, but it is a different message I'm bringing to you from those who may have heard me preach on this text before. Where Paul writes this fervent, burning book with such zeal and such concern and such worry and anxiety over these churches in Galatia. But I want to start at the end because ultimately what Paul is presenting and the truth that you and I must grasp in today's culture and society is that we also must hold to what Paul declared at the end of this book. Paul, having been the great missionary, the Jew that became a Christian and was then persecuted and ultimately put to death for his loyalty and for his service to Jesus Christ, said this, God forbid that I should ever glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto 
the world. He encapsulates everything that he has said in the book. And what he basically says is, first of all, my only glory in my life, if I'm in prayer, if I'm in discussion, if I'm preaching, if I'm walking, whatever I'm doing, he said, my only glory, the only thing that's really important to me is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he didn't mean simply having a little cross, and there's no problem with that, by the way, to wear a little cross or a symbol. That wouldn't have been done in that day. But he's not talking about the cross in that sense. What he's talking about is the work that was accomplished on the cross. He's talking about the work of Jesus on the cross. He's talking about his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, and that he's the coming king. But then he follows on to state the impact of this cross on his life. This is a challenge to all of us. He said, not only do I glory that Christ is everything to me in this life, but he said, by this cross, by Jesus, he said, the world is crucified to me and I to the world. What does that mean? It means that the world has given up on Paul. <laughs> it means no matter what capabilities he has or gifts, the world has said, Paul's a lost cause. He's so sold out to God that there's, there's no point. The world, the spirit of the world, has given up on Paul. Why? Because Paul is under the control of the Holy Spirit. And so as a result of being under the control of the Holy Spirit continually in his life, he said the spirit of the world has given up on the world. And Paul says, it has given up on me and I have given up on it. He said it holds no attractions. There's nothing about the world that entices me simply because I'm engrossed with the work of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's the core of the book of the Galatians. That's, that's the message that we today have to take from it. But what led to the book? Well, I've, as I've said, I entitled it The Defense of the Cross. That's, that's why he's writing it. Paul has been to Turkey, modern-day Turkey, called Achaia at that time. In the southern region, he has established several churches, small churches meeting in homes. They didn't have church buildings, conference centers. They met in homes. And what happened was generally the wealthy people had the bigger homes, so the meeting would be in their homes. That was the general way it was done. So these homes were established, as it were, formed as churches because the people of God had gathered together and they, he would hopefully uh, set up elders or leaders to look after. But he really, I mean, he was concerned because these were young converts. They didn't know a lot. They were in a culture that was completely opposed to them. There was always the risk of false doctrine. Many, so he always was concerned about these churches. And the Galatian region, because Galatia is not a church, it is a region, but there are several churches. And he founded them, you will find it in the mid-chapters 13, 14 of the book of Acts. If you read that, you'll find that's where they were all formed. And that's how he missioned. And so these little churches are in their early stages, but he has had to leave. Commit them to the Lord that God will look after them, and then he has to go on on his journey. So word comes through. He has left these churches. He has traveled. And as he has traveled, word has come from Jerusalem. Jerusalem, of course, is where the church started on the day of Pentecost. All the Jews, many, many Jews, thousands of them came to Christ. They have believed in the Messiah, accepted Jesus as the Messiah. And so there's great joy in Jerusalem. But, but something's happening, and Paul's getting very anxious because some of the Jewish believers, saved people, have traveled from Jerusalem down to these wee churches that are in the homes. Now, Archaea, modern-day Turkey, these are mainly Gentiles. These are non-Jews. These people have come from paganism to Christ. 
And they're so thrilled that they have just, by trusting in Christ, they have come into the family of God and the promise of God, and they're so thrilled. But what happens is these teachers come from Jerusalem who are believers, and they begin to say, listen, uh, it's not enough. Believing in Jesus is not enough. You need to be circumcised. You need to kind of fall in partially under the old religion of Judaism because all Jews, all male Jews, had to be circumcised. And Paul is devastated that this has happened. And it's the most caustic book in the New Testament. Now, to the average person who would say, what's the big issue? What's the problem? Well, that's what we're going to look at for a short time and then we're going to come. I promise not to preach too long tonight if I can help it. I hear a laugh there. <laughs> I said, if I can help it. Okay. These Jewish believers, we can learn much from them. And I want you to see that this is not just an historic book. Everything I'm going to explain about what happened in those days is actually happening today. And I want you to see from it how we can be so easily impacted as Christians and not even know, okay? So it is totally relevant for you and I today. And I hope that if you listen to the message, that I hope you'll maybe get it afterwards of Paul and you'll listen to it again because it's a, it's a vital truth for the church today. It's vital for you and for me. So what happens is these Jews who have become Christians travel down and say you need to be circumcised. Why are they doing it? What made these people go down and do this? Because it wasn't said on the day of Pentecost, but why? Well, there's two main reasons why they're doing it. One is because the old religion, Judaism, the Jewish faith, could die. They have become believers, but they're still fond of the old religion. <laughs> to put it in modern context, they have become Christians, but they're in a church or a religion or a system that, that, that isn't truly leading them to God, but they're going to hang into it. They're going to mix the two. They're going to pull them together so that salvation isn't going to be just faith in Christ, there's going to be other stuff too. And Paul's anxious about it. And we should always be anxious about it as well. And so what happens is they're afraid of losing the old religion because after all, when the gospel goes out to the Gentiles, very soon the church is Gentile dominated. And the Jews, that concerns them. Today, the church of Jesus Christ is very, very small percentage is Jewish. It's a Gentile church. But the Lord promised that to Abraham, that the gospel, that the seed of Abraham, Jesus, would ultimately lead the gospel to all nations and to all peoples. And so the gospel, thank God, is free to all. If it had just been confined to the Jews, the news is bad for you and I tonight, unless you happen to be Jewish. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So the first reason was they were afraid of losing the old religion. The second reason was that Jews had a unique position in the Roman Empire. You see, the Romans had many gods. If you went into some of the large uh, buildings that were set aside, pantheons or whatever different names they gave them, but there was these large buildings set up and there was gods galore. If you went into a person's house who was, who was living in the region or in Rome at that time, you would have went in and they would have had a little cupboard and you'd open the cupboard and there'd have been a multiplicity of wee gods. And they'd have bowed down to this one and that. That was the way it was. They had loads of gods. And there was one for this and one for that and one for the other. And so you chose whatever gods you wanted. But you did have to bow down to some of the gods. That was the demand of Rome. And you had to worship Caesar. But the Jews would not do it. 
And so when the Romans demanded that the Jews would bow to them and bow to Caesar, they just put their heads down and they said, cut my head off. And very soon the Romans realized these people have a real problem with other gods. And the way we're going, we're going to have none of them left. So eventually they compromised and said, well, seeing as it's, I mean, the rest of the people, if we threaten them, they just do it. But these Jews are a problem. So they said, okay. So if you're a Jew, what you will do is you will not pray to Caesar, but you must promise to pray for Caesar. They said, that's no problem. We'll pray for Caesar, but we'll not pray to him. And that was the rule that was established in society. But what was happening was, since Jesus had come, Jews had been getting converted and Gentiles. And the Gentiles would not bow down to Caesar. But they had come from the Jews. And the Romans got a little bit worried and said, what is going on? We thought that that the Jews, you just literally had your religion and you, but here now you're introducing something to the Gentiles and they're now not going to bow down. And it was a real problem. And so the Jews who were believers became a little concerned and frightened. And they said, we better get a little bit more of Jewish religion into these Gentiles and then we'll not be persecuted. There's nobody going to cut our heads off them because we're safe. So there was a lot of things going on in the minds of these people. But what they did was they came in and they began to take over the church. Let me say to you, for those of you who are in church, those of you who may presently or in days in the future become leaders in a church or churches, always watch out people that come in and take over. Watch people who are looking for leadership. Because that's exactly what happened here. When Paul, as they say, when the cat's away, the mice will play. And what they did was they came in and they deliberately discredited Paul. They told lies about Paul. And they misinformed the churches about Paul. And they did it in order to take over the churches. Well, in the light of these things happening, Paul sends his letter. And Paul sends the message that we have read of already of the cross. (laughs) Paul tells them that the only way you can be made right with God is through faith in Christ alone. Very important. In fact, it was this truth that Paul labored at in his day was ultimately the truth that Martin Luther, the Roman Catholic priest, who was searching for God and searching to get peace with God, discovered this very truth that was lost for a thousand years largely in Christendom and in in most of Europe, a thousand years called the Dark Ages, because this truth of justification being made right with God through faith alone was lost. And Paul didn't want this message to become become polluted, twisted. He said it had to stay pure. Why did he do that? Here's the reason. Paul said because justification by faith alone leads you into a relationship with God. You have peace with God. You are adopted into his family. But not only that, the wonderful thing is that the Holy Spirit, who is sent by the Father and the Son, will come to personally live inside you. He will give you all the enabling you need to live a Christian life. And Paul said, actually, without that, you cannot live this life. You can be religious. But you cannot live the life as God wished it to be lived without the empowering, filling, and controlling of the Holy Spirit. That's what the book's about. Paul makes it out. There's so many texts, but I haven't time. But read it when you go home. He says, it's by the Spirit. It's by the Spirit. You see, friends, what we have presented in this little book 
is a road. It's a narrow road. It's called the road of liberty. And Paul is aware of this road. The Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus have shown him it. It's clear in his mind he has been sent by God to teach the Gentiles. And so he presents to them, there's this highway. It's a narrow highway, but it's called liberty. And you can only get onto it by faith in Christ alone. You can only stay on it by walking it in the power and unction of the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to a verse, just to, I'll confirm it to you in case you think I'm saying too much myself. Look, look at chapter <clears throat> 5. Chapter 5 and verse 16. Paul says to them in chapter 5, verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit. Now he's talking about the, the road. You remember the little narrow road we've mentioned? It's called liberty. He said, walk that road. And he said, here's how you do it. Walk in the Spirit. You must be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can't walk it any other way. It can only be walked. And I'm going to keep repeating it. You can only walk the road of liberty. There's only one road. God has no others. No plan B. Only one narrow road. You get onto it through faith in Christ. You start walking the road of liberty in the power of the Holy Spirit. So the key for the Christian is, am I filled with the Holy Spirit? Am I being filled with the Holy Spirit? Okay? So he says, walk in the Spirit. And he said, here's what will happen. As you walk under the control of the Spirit, the flesh nature that you were born with, that is still present at conversion, he said that nature will not operate. It won't operate. When you're under the control of the Spirit, he said the flesh won't operate. So the key to victory, the key to pleasing God, the key to ultimately getting to heaven and doing it in a way that brings joy to God and joy to your heart is that I must learn above all other things in the Christian life, all the other things I have ever heard, I've got to learn personally how to walk the road of liberty in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the need of the church tonight. It's for every individual. So, he said, walk in the spirit you'll not fulfill. And then he said in verse 17, the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, the contrary one to another, that, ye, the, that what ye cannot do, the things that ye would. What he's saying is, these two can never be bedfellows. You can't have the two of them. You can't be walking in the spirit and in the flesh at the same time. They're not compatible. They're like oil and water. They won't mix. He said, and, and he says, as he points that out, that they're incompatible. Then he reiterates what he has said in verse 18. He says, but in the light of that conflict, he said, but if ye be led or guided by the spirit, ye are not under the law. So you can see the emphasis is all on the Spirit for the road of liberty. That's what Paul is proclaiming. That's what he wants the church to hear. He knows that's the key for the future. If the churches will continue to exist, if they'll continue to glorify God, this is where they must be. Paul sees it so clearly. Well, not only is there liberty, but at the side of the little narrow road that we call liberty, there's a ditch. I want you to see the ditch at the side of the little narrow road called liberty. And the little ditch at down the side is called legalism. Here's legalism down here. Now legalism, there's a cage, a big cage. And when the person goes down into legalism off this road, because that can happen, you can move out of the spirit and you can move down the bank or you can trip and fall into it. But there's a cage there and it's hard to get out of. It's a hard boy to get out of legalism. 
Okay? So this is the believer, and this is where Paul's anxious now, okay? This is anxiety. We're going to look at the two ditches. There's two, but we're looking at, at the first one. And so we've got the little road that's called liberty, and you only get that in the Spirit. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. But then he said, you, if you trip or fall, you go down into this one. Now, you see, this is how people generally approach being right with God. There's four approaches. A few of them are well known to us. The other two maybe not so popular. But Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. So Paul believed that you could be right with God as a Jew by keeping approximately, I think it's about 613 laws in around that. And when Paul was confronted and gave his testimony, he said, regarding keeping the law, I was blameless. Paul was a self-righteous man. He sought with all his power to keep those 600 rules and the Ten Commandments among them. I mean, he was an amazing character. The life of, of, of control and manipulation of himself to stay a good Jew is, is outstanding when you consider it. There's nobody like that today. We don't, we don't even advocate that type of thing today. John Wesley was like that. They, they started what was called in uh, was it Oxford. They started the Holy Club. Him and George Whitfield and others. And they tried to live so righteously as students in the college. They were mocked for it. But they tried to keep the law. Paul believed you could be right with God just through keeping the law. Of course, he found out that it couldn't happen. Because you can't get to heaven by keeping the law. Look at that in a moment. But then we have the average person, that's the person in Ireland that you're going to meet, the person that you and I were perhaps in the past. And what they believe is not that it's by works alone, but it's by works plus faith. In other words, I do the best I can, I keep as many commandments as I can, and then I trust God for the other bit. The bits I didn't do, God will step in, she'll get me to heaven. That's the general view. Works plus faith. It's not biblical, but that's where most people are. Then, of course, we have this group that we're talking about now, the legalists. And what they believed was, we believe in faith in Christ plus works. We believe that you come to Christ, but then on top of that, you have to be circumcised you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do the other. This is a very common problem in the evangelical church, if you weren't aware of it. Very common. More, some churches are more prone to it than others. Generally, churches that would be regarded as holiness churches. There's not that many of them now, but generally, holiness churches are the most vulnerable to this. I don't want to point out denominations, but I want to give you a few examples. A number of years ago, there was a denomination sent out evangelical and good people. I'm not here in any way to be offensive to any brother or sister in the Lord. But the denomination sent out a message that the, the congregations of that entire denomination would not be allowed to dance in a certain way. They, they put that out. And it became a bit of a laugh for even, even on the news. Now, I was quite shocked at the time that that denomination did that, that there was nobody in leadership in the church recognized that that's pure legalism. Faith in Christ, plus, you can't do that. Now, what's the problem with laying down that rule? I mean, it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. I'm not talking about that. But the problem is that when you introduce a rule, for example, let's say you're not allowed to do a certain kind of a dance as a Christian— what happens is when you see other Christians who do that dance, you become extremely proud that you don't do it. And you become extremely judgmental of the others that do it because you see they're not, they're not godly. <laughs> and what it ultimately leads to is pride in the congregation. The very opposite of what is needed. The, very, it's, it's, the intention is good, but the outcome is bad, always. That's why it shocked me that no leaders in the church recognized this is, a, this is a disaster to do this. Because you see, Paul would have done the same. Paul would have said, don't 
do that. Don't be setting up your rules and your regulations because he said the only way you can walk on this little path called liberty is the power of the Holy Spirit. You say, but, but I'm afraid that people might start to do things. I listened recently to a preacher and he dealt with this in the most wonderful way. What happened was a young man had got converted from a wild background. He went to his church in England and he said, this is many years ago, he said, I would like to go to a place of entertainment. Some Christians have told me I shouldn't go and I don't know. Now at that time, the general consensus would have been regarding that place, Christians shouldn't go. So what the pastor said was, I think you should go. Some of the people weren't happy with the pastor, a deeply spiritual man. He said, I think you should go, but here's what I think you should do. I think you should bring Jesus with you. And when you go with Jesus to that place, when you've been in it a wee while, ask Jesus, is he happy? That's all. And so he literally did that. He went to the place where they were selling tickets, and he said to the young girl, he said, I would like two tickets. She looked at him and said, uh, but there's only, who, who else is coming? He said, I can't explain, it's complicated, but give me two tickets, I want two seats. She says, no, I, I, this doesn't make sense, what are you doing? He says, I want two tickets. So eventually he said, listen, one of them's for Jesus. It freaked her out, she ran upstairs to the boss and she said, there's a guy here, he said he wants a seat for Jesus. She come down, he come down and said, listen, if he wants them for Jesus or anybody, buy, sell the tickets. Just sell the tickets. And so the two tickets were sold and he went in. He literally did. He went in and he sat down and he sat for 10 minutes and he looked around to where the seat was, where he said Jesus was. And he said, Jesus, how do you feel about this? And the Holy Spirit said to him, I don't like you being here. And he was free. He went out of it. He didn't go back. But he wasn't introduced to legalism. He had liberty by the Holy Spirit. You see, that's the wonder of this little narrow road. And so many of us have fallen down into this legalism. And there's a cage in it because it leads to pride and it's very hard to get out of. And you become very judgmental of other people. It's a hard, brutal thing. This other road, you see this little narrow road, it's a free road. It's got the love of God and the peace of God and the joy of God and the liberty of it. It's a wonderful place. But this other place, tough going tough going. And that's what Paul was concerned about. You see, friends, growing up, I remember uh, in, uh, going to certain denominations over the last 30 years, and there were certain denominations, and they would have got up and talked about the length of a dress, or talked about the length of a person's hair, or talked about a split in a skirt, or talked about things like this. I heard of a, a case where there was a Bible college over in America, and what happened was whenever the uh, students went in, the girl students, one of the staff came out and measured how far it was from their knee to the dress to the floor, and then they had to... <clears throat> That's pure legalism. It becomes ridiculous, by the way, over time. I heard of two, two pastors. I remember years ago hearing of two pastors. Their, their children got, got uh, saved, and then their children decided to get married, and the both fathers were holiness preachers. Now, I'm not against holiness preachers, but I'm giving you the, the, what Eric Stewart used to call the obnoxious holiness. It's not, not biblical, but it's an obnoxious old thing. And what happened was the two of them arrived, the two fathers arrived to do the wedding. And the church into whom the bride, her father, was standing at the door, he would not let the groom's father into the church, into the wedding. He wouldn't let him in. He said, what's wrong with me? He says, it's your tie. The breadth of your tie, it's not holy. Your tie needs to be this width. And they had to, I, I was told this, they literally had to go to hold the wedding, to go to the pastor's house to get a tie like his to put onto the father of the groom. That's when it goes nutty. Nutty. You're, you're, you're gone now at this stage. But listen, still saved, still born again, but under legalism to the extreme, but never enjoying the little road. Liberty. Wonderful little road, liberty. And so it goes on. It has been said that legalism is obedience to the law to the neglect of the Holy Spirit. Listen to that again. 
Legalism is obedience to the law to the neglect of the Holy Spirit. Another said, legalism always produces pride in the heart. It always produces pride in the heart. Now let's move on very quickly. Because there's one side, but then let's go quickly to the other. So we're on the little road, and we have come to the Lord, and we have been taught about the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We have given our lives unconditionally to Jesus. We are abandoned to him, and we say, Lord, I just want your will. I want the Holy Spirit to guide and lead me. And so the Holy Spirit comes and fills our lives. And he brings us up onto this little road and we start walking. And we may trip and fall down into the legalism and we start to tell people how they should live and tell people that you don't agree with them. And God's very gracious and he pulls you back up out again because it's not a nice place. It's not a nice place down there. He pulls us up out of it and on we go. But then, as we're so worried about that one, we go to the side of the little road and before we know it, we have, oh, we're over the other side. And we're down into the other side. We're, we have lost our liberty again and we have gone from legalism and now we're in license. Now we're in the place we can do whatever we like. We don't have laws. We don't have any rules. We don't have any regulations. You see, it's, it's like three people who are going through a, a, a maze or, a, or, or a, what's a swamp. And the three people are all representative. We have the person who's on the little liberty road. And then we have the person who's on the legalistic road. And then we have the person who's on the license road. And so they have all to go through this maze, this swamp called life. And get to the other side, to the celestial city heaven. Well, we meet legalism first, and legalism has a load of rules and a book and a map. And he says, well, I'll do it because I've got all the rules. So he starts walking out and travels. He's doing not too bad in places. I mean, he's got rules to guide him and protect him in certain ways, but it's a bit lonely. It's a bit lonely. But he keeps, he keeps going on, and he travels. Then it gets dark. And he hardly knows where he is. Oh, terrible. And then, of course, another person comes. And he's Mr. Liberty. And he doesn't have a map. He doesn't have laws. He doesn't have rules. He is a person with him. Holding him by the hand. Jesus. Jesus is just telling him, come on with me here, here. What do I do here, Lord? I'll do this. Lord, what do I do here? You just move that way. All right, Lord, that's great. He's Mr. Liberty. But then you've Mr. License comes. And Mr. License comes in and he says, it's a free for all. I'll go wherever I jolly well like. And the warning from Paul in this epistle is, be very careful because you might not get to the celestial city. That's the warning. Do whatever you like. Live as you like and say, I'm born again. I invited Jesus into my life when I was so many years old. And I'm safe. I'm, I'm okay. I've done this. I do that. I'm corrupt here. I'm corrupt there. I'm twisted here and yonder. But I'm doing whatever I like. And at the end, I'll be at the celestial city. Paul says, don't do that. Don't do that. License is dangerous. And you see, friends, there are certain denominations in our country, and they're very vulnerable to the, to the legalistic stuff. But there are many, and they're on this other side now, and many new ones who are being born in our, in our country. This is, this is where they're going. And the reason why people move to license is because they have seen too much legalism. They didn't see reality in it, and they said, I'm sick of that. And so they said, we're throwing off everything, and we're going to just go this way. But they have missed the little road that Paul declared to be the road, liberty. They have missed it, because they're not controlled by the Holy Spirit. Dear friends, this 
warning is presented in chapter 5 and 6. And I want to just mention a few things very quickly if you turn with me. And this is, I'm just going to run through them very quickly for time. But in Galatians chapter 6, Paul is then speaking to the people who are in license. These are people who have decided, you know, I'm saved and I can do what I like. I can live as I like. It doesn't matter. I'm saved. The minister told me if I ask Jesus into my heart, all's well. This is what Paul says. He says, if a man is overtaken, he's talking about a Christian. He says, if a Christian is overtaken by a fault or a sin, he said, the ones who are spiritual, the ones who know about this road, this road of the Spirit, he said, those ones, those are the ones, he said, that need to get beside that person. But he said, make sure you're aware that you could fall yourself. I hope, I hope you're not in the position that you believe that you couldn't fall. I hope that you have never got to that place to say, well, that would, that would never happen to me. Because to even suggest such a thing is setting you up for it to happen. My dear friends, I have no idea and I wouldn't predict how I'll finish this road. But I call on God and ask him for help. Because I realize new temptations come, trials come, disappointments come, sadness comes. Many things can come that can knock us down. And we constantly, day by day, need the grace of God in our lives. So there's no room here for saying, that won't happen to me. And Paul says, you be careful. And then he said in verse 2, and this is one of the callings of the church, by the way. I meet more people and they say to me, Alan, I hate church. I don't like church. I don't want to go to church. And, and it's a very common theme. And the reason is because church is not what God intended it to be. These are basic things. And I'm not talking about a whole theory of, of, uh, to do with doctrines. Or, I'm just talking about a basic a basic, and here's one of the basics of what, why God ordained church, one of the basics. Look at verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's one of the basic responsibilities of the family of God. If a brother or sister in the Lord, they're in trouble. They're having a bad time. There's a difficulty. I've become aware of it, so I'm going to help them. It's very, very, I mean, you don't need to pray five days about it. You don't need to fast for a month. There's a need there. I'm going to, I can help. I'm going to help. Paul says that's, that's the basic. And when you do that, my friend, when you pour in love, when you pour in concern, what happens is that begins to warm the cold heart of that believer. And that can be enough to get them back up on their feet again and get them in the way. And so Paul says that needs to be your attitude. You remember when President Kennedy, well, not that I was born, by the way, but President Kennedy said in his inaugural speech, he said, don't ask what America can do for you. Ask what can you do for America. And you need to do that with the body of Christ. You need to say, not what can the people of God do for me, but what can I do for the people of God? That needs to be your attitude. That was Paul's attitude. It was always one of seeking to give support and help. And so he says, bear one another's burdens. Restore the person. But then very quickly, he moves on to verse 3. For there's a problem among these people that are kind of uh, full of license. They're doing what they want. And he says to him, if a man thinks he be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. <laughs> there were people in the church. Now, you'll not believe this. Of course, you wouldn't be like this or me either. These are, this, this is a species that has died out. This species mentioned in Galatians, they were full of themselves. But they have died out. We don't need those anymore in the church. Sure we don't. You see, my dear friends, what had happened, these ones, is they were, they were full of pride of their name, of who they were. They were proud of their achievements. They were proud of their gifts. 
They were proud of so many areas of their life. And so when they came to church, they sat in the top seat. And there's no way there's going to be any helping of anybody else. And if there is any helping, it's just because the pastor's watching. Because it's all show after all. And Paul knew that was in the church. And Paul had a, had a solution to that. There's a solution. Paul said, I want you, first of all, to stop looking at other people and comparing yourself. Do you do that? Do you compare yourself with others and say, well, he, she, she, well they're not doing it just as good as me. And he's doing right but better than me. And I'm not too bad. Do you ever think like that as a Christian? God said, no, 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 no. God says, hold on, your mathematics out the window, your wrong scale, everything's gone. God says, that's a problem. Stop the comparing. Stop the comparing. Paul said, what I want you to do, and he, he, he says it in the next verse, let every man prove his own work. What is he saying? He said, I want you to go aside with God. Just go aside with God and forget about what your pastor thinks and what the Christians are thinking. And Because listen, you could be number one today and you could be down the gully tomorrow. I, believe me, I know all about it. You, you can be great one day and you can be in the bin the next. The only person who can change God's opinion of you is you. See, it doesn't matter if the world happened to say, Alan's the best Christian in Ireland. I don't think it's going to happen. Like, But if it did, and they all voted and they said, Alan's the best Christian. Ah, but boy, you get an award. I did get an award recently, actually, but I'll not talk about that. It was more comic thing. But nevertheless, <clears throat> you become number one. Does that affect how God thinks about me? No. But then next year, I did something naughty. I said something in the pulpit that people didn't like. And that can happen to me a lot. And the next year, they vote, and he's in the bin. What happens? Well, God obviously has looked at public opinion, and God said, Alan, I'm sorry. But I can't look at you the same. You, I mean, your public opinion is put you down. My friend, God doesn't do that. God's not one bit interested in what people think. The only person that I should be worried about what thinks about me is God. And that's why he says, get in alone before God and get the focus in the right world, in God's world. And he says, when you do that, he said, then give yourself to God and learn to do his will. And he said, when you start doing his will, he said, you'll have great joy in yourself. I'm doing God's will. I'm enjoying it. Enjoying this wee narrow road called liberty. Sure, I'm not doing big things. Yeah, I'm not on the radio. I'm not Billy Graham. Doesn't matter. I'm on the road that God is for me, and I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying the Lord. My friend, that's what it's all about. Self-exaltation, God's against. Let's conclude. I'm just going to jump over the next verse, and we're going to come to the, to the final point. Look what it says in verse, <clears throat> verse 9. Now, here's the one where most of us can suffer. <laughs> Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Yeah, boys, it's, it can be tough going, can't it? It's day in, day out, and trials, difficulties, disappointments. Disappointments from Christians feeling you, and then the terrible disappointments of your own internal failures when you maybe sin against the Lord and the shame and the awful disappointment you feel. There's so many trials and problems and keeping a family and maybe stress financially. There's a thousand things going on. And Paul said in this this little road, this little liberty road, he says, be careful not to get weary. Be careful, he says, not to set down the arms and the weapons and say, I'm, I'm tired, I'm tired. You know, my friends, in normal circumstances, we would all give up. Endurance would give up. I, 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 I couldn't. When I look back, I'm aware of failures in my life, but I couldn't, looking back to successes, if you could call them that, successes, 
where people were saved, where, where breakthroughs came with God. As I look back, well, how, how did that happen? How did that happen? Simply because the Holy Spirit was given freedom in my life to demonstrate his power. It's as simple as that. Any victories there are, they're God's victories. But he gives them to us. But they're his victories. And so any victory I want to have in the future, it's going to be God's victories. It's going to be God's. So what do I have to do in order to stay out of this, this, this terrible pit called legalism? What am I going to do to stay out of this license where I'll do my own thing? I've got to be completely and totally committed to Jesus Christ. My life, my ambitions, my will, my heart, my everything, I give to him and keep it on the altar. And I ask him to cleanse me and fill me and keep filling me with the Holy Spirit until I learn to walk in the Spirit. And then, as I do, I end up like that man walking through the swamp. Or like the man in the cinema with the two tickets. And I say, Jesus, what do I do here? I'm not on my own with all my rules. I'm not running mad my own way. I have Jesus with me. Can you understand now why Paul said at the end, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross. It's all to do with what Jesus has done. Christianity is all about Jesus. It's about me each day and you each day being a friend of Jesus. That's what it's all about. And it's easy to miss that. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your precious word. We thank you that your word is truth and light. And I pray that the truth of your word will really bless your people. I pray that it'll build them up, Lord. I pray that they will have a desire and a longing to be on that road called liberty. Heavenly Father, I just pronounce your blessing on your people now. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're going to close with a little chorus. All to him I freely give. I would ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Saviour, I surrender all. Amen. And God bless you all. There's a cup of tea, so please don't rush out if you can stay.